Hey, and welcome to the Heuristics Podcast. This is Kobe ben Melech. My guest for this episode is Sarah Ward. She's a 39-year-old woman who's been going through years of in vitro fertilization treatments, or what's, I guess, commonly known as IVF, to have her first kid. Uh, it's, it's an amazing technology. Uh, it's helped a lot of women, a lot of women dealing with infertility. One million kids in the U.S. were born in the 20 years, roughly 20 years, up until 2015. And that's a lot of people that are now loved and cared for in the world. So hooray for that. But I also wonder about whether young women nowadays get a misleading impression about their ability to have kids. With women having kids later in their lives than what they used to. Maybe in the back of their minds they think, well, at least I have IVF as an option. And this episode serves as a kind of wake-up call. Um, IVF is great, but it's not, it's not easy on women. And it doesn't guarantee success either. It was really great to talk to Sarah. She has got a hell of a spirit. And she tells it like it is. It makes you want to root for her in life. It's just audio this time. Sorry about that. Anyways, here's my conversation with Sarah. <laughs> Technology baffles me completely. Same, same. I'm actually uh, increasingly more on your side of things. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you see. I just... I'm done. Um, but, but. I mean, the whole thrust of my podcast was to talk about how we interact with technology because it's just everywhere. And it makes me think that um, we're forgetting, like, who we are. Definitely. Right. It's a new identity. I, I can't stand it. And that's why I carry a diary with me. Mm. Everywhere I go. Interesting. Mm. Wait, okay. So um, before, before I, I ask my first question, whatever the hell that is, mm -hmm. but I just... I want to set the tone for this, which is like, this is a heart to heart, you know, I, yeah. I'm, I'm seeing a first and foremost, a person Okay. and you're going through something. And as a parent, I, you know, it's like, I can, I can, I can, I can only imagine that it's, this is fucking hard. It's extremely hard. Yeah. It's yeah. extremely hard. Like, especially where I'm the eldest of three girls and I've got two younger sisters who have both recently given birth as well. So it makes things... As a, as a, don't get me wrong, as an amazing experience to become an auntie as it is, yeah. and I'm not yeah. there, it's just, it, it's it's hard in its other battles of what I'm going through as well. So it's more Wait, yeah, yeah, yeah. mentally. So yeah. where where are you right now in the whole IVF process? Where am I? So I was supposed to start a cycle today, and I haven't. Because? And because of everything that's going on, I'm going to move. Mm. And it would have worked out time-wise, if I'd started today, usually all the stuff usually lasts about 12 days. And by the time that I'd got to that point to go for my egg retrieval, I think I would have been right bang in the middle of moving. And it's just too stressful to put myself through this this month if I'm yeah. going to do this stuff. And do you feel like there's a part of you that w if you're going to do it, you're going to be in the right mindset? Yeah, yeah. there's no point. I, j I, I strongly believe that mindset is about 80 maybe 75 percent of the whole fertility process i think amazing amazing uh, it's my it that's my be. yeah that's my sense of things i mean I'm it's not... easier said than done half the time but it is i yeah. reckon so yeah 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 well that that's what actually makes that's what makes me admire people like you so much it's like you have to it's a mental thing as much as a, yeah. a yeah. scientific thing yeah it is extremely mental on not just me but my husband as well so it's just yeah like, yeah, yeah, a lot going on. Yeah, no, I, I, I'd obviously love to hear what you think about it from his point of view. Oh God, I could tell you. But um, but but, I guess like I, I don't know anything really about you. So like, first of all, how how old are you? I'm 39. Just turned 39 in August. Okay. Um, I lived here nearly six years. November fourth will be six years. Okay. And I've been a hairdresser for 23, almost 23 years, and. Yeah, am I I'm just trying to enjoy my life living in this country as best as possible? To be yeah. completely honest, but yeah, yeah, and and so and how long have you been married? Ten years, just gone. We've been together twelve. 
Oh, nice. Yeah. 10 years. 10 years in August it was, yeah. Wow. I mean, you guys, if I think about it, you you guys are forging together through some fucking hard waters, man. It's not, it's been nonstop since we moved to Israel. So, Mm. yeah. So, I think it makes a very good relationship if you are best friends and you talk or try to talk through all the problems. Yeah. And I think when you have these majorly huge, huge issues, if you work together as a couple and take little bite-sized chunks, I think you work through it. And we've worked through, we've overcome so many obstacles living here. We lost everything in a fire a couple of years ago. Wow. Um, we have been in and out of jobs, like with my husband losing his job because of COVID and all of this, and we're still playing catch up. Yeah. It, it is what it is and life is hard and I don't think it would have been any different if I lived in the, in the UK. Mm. I don't think it would have been any different if I lived in America. I just think because I live in Israel, I think the only problem is the language really, the, bar- yeah. the barrier of that. Any other obstacles, I would have faced them in any other country. Well, I'm going I'm to ask you about that because it's, it's one thing that was also on my mind before before we got here. But So you guys met in the UK? Yeah. And he's, yeah, he's friends, yeah. What was his name? Sorry, Elliot. Elliot, and Elliot's yeah. Elliot's British. Isn't Elliot is British. We grew up in the same sort of neck of the woods. I, I broke up with my ex fiance. I lived in Manchester, and I moved back to London. Wait, why ex fiance? Ex fiance. You, you, you just throw that out. There. Yeah, <laughs> I was engaged. I was listen. When you're 18 and you meet somebody, you think you fall in love. And I was with him for seven and a half years. Got engaged, and then it's a very very long story and a bitter story. But did you know? When did you know? Uh, I'm not. I'm not going. I'm, uh, not, I'm not flushing my life. Five down months before the wedding, I oh. lost everything. Yeah. Well, hey, at least at least you. At least I know. You made the right choice. Yeah, I probably right? would have ended up living in some council <laughs> that in the middle wow. of nowhere, with like 15 kids. So like, no. Um, <laughs> but so you were you were 25. I was 25, almost 26 when I moved back, and. I think I was back in London for about a year and then I bumped into Elliot's brother and we got friendly because we used to be friends years before at school. Yeah. And then one afternoon he asked me to come and do Elliot's mum's hair. I went round there and Elliot was there. We got chatting. So you met the mum and, oh, uh, and you had your first I knew date. the family. <laughs> it's like the whole, the Jewish community in that part of the, uh, the, the London is actually very small. It's mm-hmm. actually a smaller community now than it was is in North London. Okay. He, his mum and his nana, his nana used to work in the local deli for years and his mum was always like a school, worked in the school. So, you know, she was a chef at the schools, like dinner ladies and things. Mm. So I went to cut her hair and then he and I got friendly. And off the back of that, he asked me out and I laughed at him because I thought he was joking, <laughs> honestly. <laughs> and then two months after our first date, we were engaged and married Whoa. a year and a half later. Holy shit. 2010, oh we got engaged, and then 2012, we got married in Florida, in Miami, just outside Miami. Wow. Wow. Yeah. It wasn't really a whirlwind romance because we had like two years to be with each other, but a lot of people turned around and said that we wouldn't last. We were talking about this on Shabbat on Friday night. Mm. We were saying that a lot of people, because another friend of ours had just got engaged, but they've only been together a couple of months as well, mm. and they're getting married in December. Mm-hmm. So I was like, we were talking about things are meant to be, and I'm a great believer. If things are meant to be, they're meant to be. And yeah. I've been with him 12, 12 years, married 10, and yeah. I could say bugger off to the people who told me six months it wouldn't last. But you know what's also amazing is that you you ha- you were someone that called off a wedding. Yeah. So, like, there's part of you that I suppose it, there could have been a part of you that would have said, oh, you know, maybe not rush into something. Like that, but you just said, fuck that. <laughs> I just thought to my, I think when you get to a certain age, you know. When you know, you know. I yeah. think um, where I'd experienced the whole engagement, buying a house and everything else before, it, it, it was insignificant things like the wedding itself for me and anyone else that's listening out there. Believe me when I tell you, it is the completest waste of time getting a massive wedding <laughs> just so that you can have this big day. I've, I've done the planning of a wedding. It went completely out of control. <laughs> I didn't know who the, half the people who were coming to the wedding had no idea. Yeah. And when I planned this very intimate 12 people wedding in Florida, in Lo- Fort Lauderdale, yeah. 
I planned everything. I remembered every single thing. Every moment of my wedding, having to have the people that I care about most there. Mm. And that, to me, is my most important. Intimate setting. You haven't got to yeah. be somebody you're not. And then I'm a hairdresser. So I get to see a lot of these brides and they are really trying to be someone they're not. And mm. it shouldn't be like that. You think that's the, is that, does that explain the whole bridezilla? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. These women... <laughs> They get their noses done. They get all these different things. And I had once, about four years ago, this girl, um, and she was had a friend doing her makeup and I was doing her hair. Yeah. And because she felt like she had a few wrinkles on her face, her friend got two pieces of hair and told me to twist them and twist them so I could pull her eyes back. I'm like, it's your wedding day. Your future husband has seen you in your worst possible state. Why are you going to start making yourself look ridiculous? There's no mm. point. Mm. <laughs> That's why. Yeah. Interesting. I, I never I never really thought about it and from that point of view like when I got married it was two uh, a little less than a little under 200 people. Wow. And my attitude going into it that uh, wow isn't a lot. <laughs> it's it's for a London wedding, Jewish London wedding 180 200 is about maximum that you maximum. Usually get. Okay, okay. I know here you can get up to a thousand. People. Right, right, right. I'm also uh Latin. Um, and there it's oh, also yeah, huge. Yeah, big family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. I mean, the weddings there are like five, six hundred, seven hundred people. No problem, right? Um, but but that includes, I mean, no one has 500, 600 intimate uh, relations, right? So that includes all sorts of extended family, people, you know, acquaintances and so on and so forth. Like, it's a whole game of like who to invite and who to be polite to and all that kind of stuff. But my attitude going into it was... Fuck it. Yeah. yeah. This is like, let's have fun. Like, yeah. I let it all out. Um, no no inhibitions. I, I wasn't even drunk or stoned or high. Nothing. No. Just, you know, as as much fun as I could possibly have, you know. Um, which I suppose is is, is um, what Duff, my, you know, my wife, but um, just brides in general, right? It's like they think this is my day, right? Of course they do. And it's right? not. It's the family's day. Oh, Go on. It is their day, but their families have been waiting their entire... This is how I feel. Mm -hmm. Your mum and your dad have been waiting all your life to watch you walk down the aisle and get married. Mm -hmm. In the UK, I'm not sure... Uh, here in Israel, I know they pay for it themselves, but here in the UK, non traditionally, the bride's family usually puts a fair bit into it. So, in my opinion... If the bride's family has put in enough into it, they should really have a say in what happens. Right. And I think the bride should be aware of that. Man, you should have been born in Latin America. That's, just, <laughs> that's precisely how it is over there. Yeah. It should be. Yeah. And then you have your wedding when your daughter gets married. Right, right. right. That's the, th the same thing. So I have two sisters and my parents, obviously, the, their approach to it was, we are inviting you to see the wedding of our kids. That's how like, the invitations look. Right. Remember? Mm. Old fashioned invitations used to say, All right, let's use my parents as, as an example. Louise and Barry Ward would request the um would request your presence at their daughter and son in law's wedding. Yeah. Yeah. You're the parents of the host, not the bride and groom. Right. That's another thing. <laughs> I'm, I told I'm very, very old fashioned. No, I love it. I love it. So for me, it, it was a case of, well, I'd spent I'd had my my, my money already just gone from the wedding anyway i wasn't going to argue about it mum said they've got a place in miami for lauderdale mum said why don't you do it there like, all right fine and it cost me one percent two percent of what a big wedding would cost right it's a win-win situation right i'm marrying the love of my life it's just a piece of paper it doesn't mean that i've got to pay for everyone else's pleasure to be there well i would i would take issue with the piece of paper it's not just a piece of paper. It's not, but if you've been in a relationship with somebody for a certain amount of time, this piece of paper can sometimes ruin going forward what happens. People have got married and then the stress of that first year of being married, you end up divorced. So, yes and no. Unless. It's just a bit of paper. Unless the old, uh, like, it's, 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 just, it's usually because you are the living embodiment of the the where it goes terribly wrong and, mm. you, pull, and you pull the brakes and say I'm, mm -hmm. I'm not going through with this and then you meet the love of your life and you go through and like you guys you guys seem to be unbelievably solid and oh, yeah. you know 
rock steady even through the really really tough times right now as as you it, described he losing his losing his job you're going through the fertility treatments like all this stuff is fucking difficult it's you know? very difficult it's extremely difficult but life is hard yeah yeah but no but that just you know you need to have some kind of solid foundation between of the course. two of you and then that just forges you guys even closer right of course um so so why if you, i mean i might as well ask but why why are you on the path of IVF. Okay, so when I was 18, I was training to be a hairdresser and I um, I came down quite ill one night and I went into college on the next day and I couldn't walk, I couldn't move. And they had to call me an ambulance, I ended up in hospital. They thought I had appendicitis. So I was nil by mouth for a whole week, uh, well, five days. And then on the fifth day, when I just had enough and there was no pain anymore or anything like that, and I really, this is the NHS for you back in the day, it was just use, useless. I was on a ward with old men and old women, geriatric ward. They, they shouldn't have put me on the ward anyway. So fast forward a week, they come in to me and I'm asking, am I going to have my appendix out? I haven't eaten all week. And they said to me, oh, no, you had a miscarriage. Whoa. I'm like, huh? Why didn't I get told this ages ago? Turns out that they were trying to investigate other stuff in me. I was having blood taken every day at that point. And then um, I went home. And then I got referred to a um, specialist who deals with endometriosis and things like that because of the pains I was having. Wait, I, I have no clue what a miscarriage looks or feels like. Um, well, it started off before I was actually taken into the hospital. I'd actually had like a period, but it was like an extra long one that I normally had. So it, it wasn't and it was something out of the ordinary for me. Um, and it, it, I, I couldn't walk. I could barely walk. The pain was really, really bad. And wow. then I ended up just going into the hospital, explaining all of this, and no one thought to tell me. But wait, you you had pain in your legs? Pain in my stomach, my back, my legs. And you just couldn't move. I couldn't move. It was like I could. It, if you've ever had a grumbling appendix, imagine that ten times worse. Jesus. So, and I still get that to this day even now, but I know how to manage it now. And I think my pain threshold has gone up a little bit more. But And, and is that is that standard for a miscarriage? Or that... No, this okay. was just off the back. It, the miscarriage opened up a whole nother door to the issues that I've got. So when I was referred to this specialist, this gynecologist specialist, they told me I'd had endometriosis. And for those that don't know, it's a hereditary disease. My mum's had it. My mum had it to the point that she ended up having a complete hysterectomy at the age of 41. And the hysterectomy is? Taking out the womb, the ovaries, everything. And So, so all the reproductive parts, basically. Wow. Some people actually can get away with just having a uterus taken away. Other people would get away with taking their ovaries away. It just depends how bad it is. Mine at the age of 18 were just discovered, and it wasn't that bad, but they put me on the birth control pill to manage my pain and to manage irregular periods. Mm. And that was that. This was back in, I was 18, 9-11 was when I was 18. So it was 2001. Mm -hmm. Then I was in and out of hospital having uh, blood tests and stuff every six months. And then I didn't really have any problems with it, didn't think anything of it um, until maybe just when I just got together with Elliot. And that was in 2010. Okay. So I'd gone nine years just literally taking birth control and getting checkups and making sure everything was okay. Uh, also, unfortunately, in my family, um, cancerous cells in the cervix are also quite common. Okay. So both me and my sister have had to have a colposcopy, which is where they laser them off. That's another issue we have to deal with as women. Um, wow. So nine years later, when I've actually got together with Elliot, 
he's two years older than me, two and a half years older than me. He'll be 42 in December. And we, as I said to you before, in the age of 26, 27, I knew what I wanted in life. I knew I wanted to get married. I knew I wanted children and go on and forwards. I wanted a family. And where we were, we kept going to see the doctors to find out if everything was okay. Um, I don't know how to say this without sounding ridiculous but for anyone that doesn't know the NHS they sort of seem to care about a certain sect of people than others so if you are from a minority group as years have gone on with people becoming politically correct over the years the minority groups actually got better treatment than the people who lived in the areas all their lives and it's, it makes me sound awful, but that's just the, the pure fact of it. How do you ju- how do you substantiate that? Right. I went to... Our, our area used to be a very, very Jewish area. Okay. All of the uh, young parents who had us in the 80s all moved from, like, East London and things like that. And because it became an affluent area, we lived from Essex, Ilford and Redbridge. And, and when you say Jewish area, I mean Jewish families that lived there for hundreds Primary of years. Primary school had been there since 1979. I was the second year to start the high school that has opened up. Jewish youth clubs all over the place, synagogues everywhere. How, how old is the Jewish community there? We're talking like less than 100 years? Or? Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, definitely less than 100 years because a lot of our ancestors came over during World War One and World War Two. So okay. a lot of us are only either second or third generation. Got it, got it. So over the years... I think it's just got unrecognisable. Mm. And that's what I mean by minority groups. What was happening is is that we had an influx of Muslim people coming in, Polish, um, Russian, you name it, yeah. were coming into the area, buying up all the houses, taking everyone else's jobs at the time, not now. Right. Things have sort of levelled out a bit. And it actually transpired that the Jewish community were fizzling out because they didn't want to live where a Jewish community was fizzling out. They were all moving away. Right, they, right. This is when the whole uproar of Spain, everyone moved to Marbella and people were moving out towards North London again and all of that type of stuff. Sorry, uh, you're looking at a complete ignoramus when it comes to... His, no, 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 uh, no. So people were moving to different areas because they were seeing mm-hmm. the change mm-hmm. that was happening. Right. And it wasn't the nice people. It was the extremists that hated the Jews and mm. everything. It wasn't a nice place to live. Okay. So it wasn't just change. It was, it was unsafe. Change. It was unsafe. Okay. And this was, I'm just painting a picture of the yeah, type yeah, yeah. of place I lived yeah, in. Yeah. So the doctor I was going to see, they were always saying to me, you're young, keep trying. You're young, keep trying. Didn't even consider looking into my case, seeing how bad my endometriosis have got. Because when you go for your pap smear, they don't check that. They only check if you've got a problem. That's the check for cancer. Uh-huh. So I ended up going back and forth for years and years. And they kept saying to me, the nurse, and you don't see a doctor. You only see a nurse. They only refer you to a doctor if there's something wrong. And in the UK, they give one free IVF treatment. Mm. And you have to be completely barren before they even think about it. One free, and I think it's like five thousand pound to go now. How how do they? they how do they even know? How, 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 how by getting you in and doing tests, offering you, oh well, you've been trying for a baby for eight years. You think you want to come in and have a little look and see what's going on? But by that point, it might be too late. Okay. And it got to that point, and it did because it got to the point where we had decided to make Aliyah. For that reason? Yeah, not necessarily this reason. I didn't even know about making Alia until the year before we did it. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know about the IVF thing until I arrived here. Oh, interesting. I had no idea that I'd even have that option. I was, in my mind, I was not going to have kids because it just wasn't happening naturally. And no one was helping me at that point yet. Uh, Wait, how old were you when you... When you 33 thought. when I came here. So it's only six years ago that I got it in my yeah. head that I wasn't going to have children. I just wow. felt like, you know, when you feel like you're in the middle of a room screaming and no one turns around and look at you. That is what I felt like I was doing constantly seeing doctors over and over again. And right. no one would give me a straight answer. Right. My gynecologist was unfortunately passed away. So then I had to go and find a new one. And right. at that point I decided to make Aliyah and I thought, screw it, let's right. wait. 
go and, over there. And not only are you screaming, but you're screaming like the, it's the most primal scream you, anyone could possibly have. Which help is like, me. I want to bring life into this world. Yeah, and someone needs to help me. And how how are you not listening to me right now? Like, what? It's uh, it just seems to me it's more bedside manner and lack of care, I think, and then taking priorities and moving them elsewhere. But this is just, again, my honest opinion. This yeah. is how I was treated, so I'm going to have this opinion. Right. But if you ask my mum or someone and they're very happy with the NHS, mm -hmm. I don't know if they are, but, you know, they could turn around and say, oh, she's talking such shit. It's just my personal experience. Sure, 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 sure. No, and no. I honestly have no way of finding mm -mm. out what, no, one way or the other. No, anyone else listens to this and thinking to themselves, yeah, she's chat shit. <laughs> no, it really was my mine and Elliot's experience, but... yeah. yeah. Came here. Wait, moved, hold on a second. Uh, you're, you're, you're early 30s. You think, yeah, okay, I, I can't do it. this. I'm done. Yeah. What, well, I mean, what were you thinking? What were you feeling? Well, it was the anger that pushed. It pushed me and Elliot to want to move out of the country, amongst other things that were going on. If, if your own country and your own subsidized health care won't give you the help that you think you need, what's the fucking point? Wow. So you stopped believing in the UK. I stopped believing in anything. Honestly. In anything? In anything. I stopped believing that I would be able to be a mum. I stopped believing that I would ever have any kind of future. and everything. I honestly want... Right. I was in a very, very bad place. I Both of us were. Yeah. Both of oh, us were in a Elliot really bad... Well? Yeah, of course. Elliot had other issues going on as well. But to have that, it's not like insult to injury, really. And... And I'm sure part of the reason that you married him was because he wanted to be a father. Of course. Well. Oh, my God. He'd be an incredible father. I see him now right. with kids here, our friends' children, and yeah. he is just the most incredible right. role model for these kids. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and, you, and you can see that. I bet you saw that even before you got engaged. Of course. Of course. Right. I mean, he was my friend. I married my best friend. So... Yeah. He is the only man in this world that can make me laugh to the point that I'm crying. And he is a big wind-up merchant, which is part of the, work, the reason why I laughed at him when he asked me out, because I thought he was partly taking pity and partly winding me up. <laughs> but I wouldn't have it any other way, and I don't think I could do this journey without him. Yeah. Honestly. Do you think, do you think he uses um, comedy as a, as a shield? A coping mechanism, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. He's like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you out in this sort of half-joking manner that if you reject me, well, well I can all always, right, we can still be friends. I yeah, can use the excuse that I was exactly. A joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's how he is. Oh man. Yeah. Um, okay, so so you're you're in this horrible dark place, mm. and you're staring at the rest of your life, and and you're thinking, I I'm putting words in your no, mouth. No, 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 no. You're exactly right. But, and you think like it's 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 empty, right? How do you bounce back from that? He helps. Being with my husband helps. It's... I still, obviously, I'm a quite an upbeat, outgoing kind of person. I really am. I've, I'd say bubbly is a good word for me. Mm -hmm. And it takes a hell of a lot to get me to that point where you just, you, you just see grey clouds and you don't see a light at the end of the tunnel. And it yeah. wasn't until... The process of the Aliyah and starting fresh somewhere else, with or without children. I didn't know what this country had to offer. Right, just Aliyah for anyone that doesn't oh, know. Oh, right, yeah. So Aliyah is uh, basically the immigration. You're Israel. making immigration to Israel. So right. I had no idea that... I didn't, actually didn't know what I was coming into when I came here. I hadn't been to Israel since I was 14. Mm. So, and my husband had never been to Israel before. Wow. This is how desperate we were to get out of the country. Really, it wow. was how bad the UK, in our opinion, had gotten. Yeah. So, you know, if I did have kids, I wouldn't send them to a Jewish school I went to because it, it's just non-existent. Mm -hmm. So coming here was almost like a breath of fresh air. It was like I, we could both finally reestablish ourselves as the people we wanted to be, not what was expected of us. Um, what does that mean? You'd have to live in Essex to understand. <laughs> Essex is very keeping up with the Joneses and um, my high school, 
Did you go to a Jewish school? I Jewish did. High, right. I so you, it's probably the, I, I hear this a lot in Jewish high schools, right? If you didn't have the right handbag, if you didn't have the right shoes, you got bullied for it, and that's what happened to me. Right. And my, I'm using like bunny ears here, inverted commas, but my friends, mm-hmm. I I only have right now. When looking back, I have one friend left in the UK. One. Yeah. The rest, and she's not Jewish, funnily enough. Mm-hmm. She and I became friends at 18. The friends that I've had for 30 odd years, nothing to do with them anymore because I discovered when I came here the person I wanted to be. And it just solidifies my reasons for being here even more. Isn't that so, fucking crazy? Yeah. So you were 33 when you uh... decided I wanted to change my life and be who you I wanted to be. Yeah. 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 I would never have been as successful as a hairdresser as I am now. I have a very thriving business, thank God, as I would be in the UK. I had to work for somebody else in the UK. Mm. Here, I'm all by myself. Yeah. Very happy. Isn't that nuts? Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm happier here, childless, and just getting on with life than I would be in the UK. Yeah. But that, I mean, that's just a testament to your spirit, right? You're like has to be because I am now more positive person off the back of moving here. Right, right, right. We'll 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 talk. We'll we'll dive more into that because mm-hmm. I think it's it's important to um to discuss more at length the spirit issue. It's, yeah, it's it's everything. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, so you moved here and you didn't even know about the whole IVF. Uh, I, I actually don't really know the, all the details. So right. What, so what does the state here give you in Israel? It's free. How many treatments? You can have two babies up until the age of 45. Oh, so you can just keep going and the state pays for it until you, once you've hit two, then it's then it's up to you. Yeah. As far as I know, it's free if you have issues. There are a lot of girls here that, which I find incredible because of the, the availability of the IVF and how freely it is. There are a lot of single women here that have had children on their own with sperm donors. Right. Um, which I think is absolutely brilliant. And no offense to any men over there, it just means we don't need you. But, you know. <laughs> but to be honest, and all jokes aside, <sighs> IVF here, it's pioneered in this country and they're trying out new things all the time. Mm-hmm. And as painful as the experience would be, it kind of gives you a nice sort of feeling knowing that someone's back in your corner. I'm mm-hmm. really trying hard for you. Mm-hmm. And that's basically what it is. So it's free up until the age of 45. And you can have two kids. It's just heavily subsidized. You have to pay for your drugs. Okay. Which is, I'm sure something we'll go into further shortly. Yeah. But um, yeah, other than that, I think I pay like, is it 36 shekels every quarter at the nurse? And then. 30, which is like $10, really, 10 pounds, basically. Oh, pound and dollar are like for like right now. Thirty six that's seven, eight quid, yeah. yeah. Seven, eight pounds, yeah. dollars, something like that. Yeah. That's so that's all I have to pay every quarter. That's nothing. No. Especially and then drugs. But well, all right, so what what is actually the process? Cause... Okay, so the whole thing started in we got here in the November two thousand sixteen. Mm-hmm. By the January, I'd booked an appointment at my gynecologist for just because I knew I had to for my usual checkups. He sits me and Elliot down and says, how long have you been trying for a baby? And as soon as I said the word eight, I didn't even finish. He goes, no, that's too long. He's too long, too long. I'm going to put you in touch with somebody. I was like, okay. After that, before I actually went for my first doctor's appointment. Wait, how did that make you feel? Because usually I was just like, whoa, I didn't expect. Because you think when you come into Israel and you think into yourself, nobody realises that we are a westernised population to an extent. Right. Right. We are stuck in 1950 in some things, but here we are pioneering so many things. We're a startup nation for a start. And it's like yeah. that medical, I could go into it. One of my clients has, has got cancer. She's not having chemo or radiotherapy. She's having gene technology done. Wow. Never heard of that before. Same. So it just tells you this country yeah. pioneering medically amazingly. Yeah, yeah. And it goes further afield as well. The doctors at Ramat Hakayal and Tel Shomer Hospital, some of them now live and work in Georgia for surrogacy reasons. What do you mean? So some of the doctors who deal with IVF in this country have actually gone to Georgia yeah. 
and they are dealing with the Israelis who use surrogates in Georgia who can't get pregnant here because surrogacy here is... Uh, right, a bit, a bit complicated. Very. Yeah, okay. And expensive. <sighs> so I went for my um, gynae appointment. He sent me then for this... I forgot what the name of it now. It's basically a scan that you go in for, but you're in like... It, it looks like an operating room mm -hmm. and they put you on this really cold metal table and they blow air into you. Jesus. Yeah. And I got told the more painful it is, the worse the problem. Uh, okay. Yeah. I so, don't even understand. Like, uh, so the the more pain that you're in during this procedure, yeah, the worse your problem is. No, I know. I get that. So, but like, how do you know what's what's the appropriate level of pain and, and, um, and not? <laughs> Elliot was waiting for me outside. Screaming. I was screaming. Yeah, I was crying like a two-year-old. I, I was screaming. And I've got a very high pain threshold. Mm -hmm. um, but I found out as well, there and then, what was wrong. In the UK, you find out it six weeks later because they send you a letter. Okay. And the guy that told me was only a sonographer or an x-ray technician. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, both your fallopian tubes are blocked. And I'm like... Obviously, I'm crying for another reason now. I'm like, this is why I can't get pregnant. He goes, this is why you can't get pregnant. And it was because of the endometriosis, which is, in short, it's uh, scar tissue that grows inside. And it sort of wraps itself around things. Mm. It's almost like an ivy plant that, you, that keeps, there's creeping plants, you know, yeah. that go into everything in your house. Okay. That's what happens. So it literally it strangled my fallopian tubes. And it's now encroaching into my uterus as well. So it's like scar tissue. Irreparably or? It just keeps growing. Just keeps growing. That's why my mum had to have hers removed because it got that bad. Okay. Some women have babies that says they can cure the endometriosis. But I'm a bit, you know, sceptical on that fact. So, it, but is it reparable or, or? Mine is too far gone. Meaning? I can't have the tubes unblocked. Normally, they'd take you and have them unblocked. Mm -hmm. From what I understand, you can't even see my fallopian tubes anymore, okay. from what he was telling me. Okay. And, oh, and they also discovered I've got PCOS. And what, what is that? Polycystic ovary syndrome, a syndrome. So it goes back to when I was put on the pill. Remember how I said to you it had its own problems back in the day? Yeah. There's common knowledge that women such as me who were put on the birth control pill just willy-nilly, like they would just hand it out like candy back in the day, mm -hmm. um, caused PCOS, polycystic ovaries. And I now have, um, on top of everything else, I've got a cyst in my right, on my right side, which is the size, well, it's two and a half si uh, centimetres diameter. That's quite big. Okay. And that's possibly causing problems with me conceiving as well. But I, I still can't get around the, the, the blocked fallopian tubes. I mean, if, if that is blocked... It can't be unblocked. Normally they go in and laser it. Mm -hmm. The minute I found out about this, mm -hmm. called both my sisters, one had um, a checkup anyway, and it turned out her endometriosis was bad, so they got it lasered off. Wow. She, she had a baby three weeks ago today. Wow. And the okay. other one, Danny, the youngest one, thank God, I don't think she actually ended up with half the problems that I did or even Charlie. And um, she had my uh, she had my nephew nine weeks ago yesterday. Wow. So I attribute my problems to helping them get pregnant in a weird roundabout kind of way. Like I, I made sure that they would always go and get themselves checked and things mm -hmm. like that because I, the pain I was going through in my head and in my in my soul, it, it, I just did not want that yeah. to happen to them. Did you, uh, it, but is, is that game over? Because I mean, you're still going through the treatments, right? So It's game over for certain things. So I wouldn't have, he, when, I, when I met with my doctor, I see a doctor called Ophir Gertler. He's the head of the IVF department in um, Asuta, Yigalalot, around the corners for here. Okay. And when I when I first went and saw him, he said to me, you're going to have to get straight on to IVF because there's another way which is called IUI, which is another way of saying artificial insemination, basically. Okay. 
I couldn't even go down that road because that means you have to ovulate. And what ovulation means is that it means that your egg has to be released into the fallopian tube in order for them to mm-hmm. inseminate the sperm into you so in order to create a baby. Mm-hmm. I can't do that. Mm-hmm. Nothing can get in, nothing can get out. Mm-hmm. So if you were to draw a picture and look at a diagram of the ovary, you've got these little egg sacs on either side and each month a follicle is released from mm-hmm. these egg sacs. Whether they've got an egg inside or not, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. But that's what happens and they're just let it, getting stuck and dying. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's basically what I've got. Okay, so so, but you still have other options, right? Which is to extract the eggs yep. from the ovary and then put it in the womb. Yeah, it's... Or several eggs, right? Yeah, that's so yeah, they, you have to produce a certain amount. Well, not have to, you try to produce as many eggs as you can. It's, yeah. It sounds pretty simple, it isn't at all, because it's the process itself is hard because you've got to think about what you go through your body goes through okay it's more than what your body goes through as well it's mentally you have to be prepared which is what we were saying before you have to be in the right state of mind to be able to do anything like this it's completely pointless if you're stressed out you've got other stuff going on because you're injecting hormones into your body which is then in turn going to make you an absolute crazy hormone case in the best of times and then to go and do something else where you've got your mind elsewhere. Some people might argue, yes, your mind is elsewhere. It might help you get pregnant. But personally, I think when you're physically forcing yourself into the pregnancy, extra stress isn't really the thing you need. So right, right. I think in the right frame of mind is very, very important. So w- when was the first time, your first try at this? Right. So my first try was two years ago. Mm-hmm. My living situation at the time, we were living in a shared house. It wasn't long after the fire, actually. It was 2000, and, no, it was more than two years ago. Oh, my God. Before COVID, I guess. Yeah. It was four years ago. It was our, Oh, my God, I've been doing this for four years. Oh God, I didn't even realize. Right, so it was four years ago, 2018. We had the fire in the January, and then the July was when I first got my first cycle. Um, who, who, do you remember the first time you got the first injection? Yeah. Where was it? I had to do it myself. All my injections I do myself. Holy shit. So the first time I did it, it was almost like an epinephrine pen. That's yeah. what they give it to you. You just twist it and then you bang it and then it's done. Because um, I I, uh, I asked because um, there's... Uh, you ever heard of the show Master of None? I've heard of it. I've never seen it. Okay. So there's uh, the third season. It tracks this uh, lesbian couple. And I, I won't ruin... You know, because really, you should watch it. It's an amazing uh, show. Um, and one one of the women wants to have a baby. The other one is sort of ambivalent, right? And they they split up. And then so there's one episode of that woman that really wanted the baby, tracking. And she's she's older. She's in her thirties, and um, it's it's just the whole process of of IVF. And I kid you not, it's it's. I think it's the most riveting hour of television I've ever fucking watched. And there's this one lovely, lovely scene, right? And she's by herself, right? And she's she's got this needle, right? And she doesn't know what to do, right? And and it's beautiful. So she phones up her mother, right, for for help, for inspiration. And what was so touching about that scene is like you could tell that the mother knew exactly what to say to help her overcome whatever the hell was of going course. on. It's just boom. Being know. a mum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like she knew, she knew exactly what her daughter was thinking, right? And I mean, in in obviously mm-hmm. fictionalized, but mothers, right? Yes, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So you were completely by yourself. Uh, yeah, I have no one here. Just my husband, no family. Yeah. And it's the most alone you feel because even I I can imagine even if my mum was here or I was in another country with my mum, whatever. If I have family here. I'd still feel very alone because unless you're going through IVF or fertility journey, whatever it is, you really don't understand it. And it's really hard for anyone else to understand it unless you've gone through at least one cycle. What what do you think people don't understand? (laughs) It's all well and good someone saying to you that I can imagine it's very hard on your body. Yeah. 
just a tad. It's more than hard on your body. I don't think people fully understand. Hard on your body and mentally as well, because mentally can also mean physically. In, because like the mental side of things, I, can, I say to people a lot that I feel like gravity is pulling me down. I feel like my whole insides are being pushed right down and I just need to sit and I can't move. Whoa. That's how I describe it when I'm going through the process because I'm just so mentally exhausted, and mentally. This, and this takes 12 days, right? Oh, yeah. 12 days of feeling like this. Yeah. Some days I have good days. Like I did a vlog, the last cycle I vlogged, and I had my good days. And for me personally, identity is a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, I've always had issues with how I look and things like that. So looking at myself in the mirror is a very hard thing for me to do when I'm going through this process because it makes you spotty, it makes you mm. pale, it makes you puffy, mm -hmm. uh, bloated. It it just makes, it. you just don't know what you're going to have from one day to the next or even one cycle to the next. So I have serious identity problems, which is very hard for me as well because I'm stood in front of a mirror all day long with clients. Mm. So I've, I don't look at myself very often. Wow. So that's the other thing that I mm. find very difficult. And it's also not fair because that's not you. Right, it's that's the drugs talking. It's exactly the drugs yeah. talking. It's 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 a chemical imbalance. It's a complete chemical imbalance. Right. So when I right. did the first one, oh, I can't, still can't believe that's four years ago. When I did the first one four years ago, mental state of mind wasn't there. We got, and then that's four years ago. Don't forget as well. Women are only born with a certain amount of eggs. Right. Men can keep going. Women, can, So your eggs decrease by half every year. So four years ago, my eggs would have been a better quality than they are now. Mm -hmm. So out of, I think we got the first round of cycle, the first cycle I ever did, mm -hmm. we got four viable eggs, I think out of eight follicles, and I'll go into that in a minute. And I then froze two embryos and used two fresh, and both times they didn't work. But then I wasn't really there in my head. I'd just moved from the fire, trying to build up clients at the same time. I'd only been here two years at that point. Mm -hmm. So it took a long time to me to build up the client base. But So you were, you were, when you say you weren't there mental, you were really stressed out? Beyond stressed. Beyond, beyond stress. And we're living in an absolute crap hour as well. But, you know, I, I, I understand now I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready to do it then. I wasn't in the right headspace. We weren't living in our own place. It, it, it just wasn't the right time. What, when do you think that clicked for you? <laughs> End of last year. Fuck. It's a long road. It's a very long road because don't forget we had COVID as well. Yeah, oh yeah. So I was... 2018 did that cycle. Fresh didn't work, frozen didn't work. And then my sister got engaged. So we decided to work out when would be okay if I did get pregnant to fly so that I would be all right to fly for my sister's wedding, which was supposed to be in 2020. Oh, COVID, right, right, right. But it sounds like though at that point you were you were pretty damn optimistic. That yeah, was I was work. trying. I right. was trying. I was just trying to work out, okay, well, if I do another cycle now... And I get pregnant. Can I fly? And then all of this like ha happen. Yeah. And then financially, we weren't in the right place at that time too. Mm -hmm. So when we actually went to go start it again in 2020, Corona hit. We wanted to start it again, and I was thinking about going during all the mask stuff when we were all wearing masks and things like that. Yeah. And I'm part of these forums on Facebook. One woman went to the Yigala Long Clinic where I go. And I think she was something maybe three or four days before her egg retrieval. So you go in for blood tests just to check you're on the right track. Mm -hmm. And um, she got a phone call late on that afternoon to say she had to scrap the entire cycle because someone had COVID. So that stopped me going as well. Oh, my God. I couldn't. Can you imagine? It's like, again, the stress of it, me moving could stop me getting pregnant, getting to that point at having COVID and you've got to inject yourself just to say, scrap it, you can't do anything about it. All those follicles you've produced, right. literally down the shitter. Right. And and you're still left with the uncertainty of when do I start again? And Exactly. And I, I honestly I... didn't think I would. 
because of what's been going on with the world. I didn't know when I would. Mm. Wow. What, so so you had the one, the first go at it in 2018. Mm-hmm. And, and then, what, how did you, like, take me through it. So so you do this treatment for 12 days and... It depends. Not okay, necessarily sorry. always 12 days. It's just the last few times that I've done it has been 12 days. Okay, okay, okay. Each cycle I've done... Right, let's disregard the first cycle I did and go to the ones I've done this year because these are more significant because of my age. I went back to it in March. You get given a prescription of all your drugs, which is also on your your apps and stuff that you make appointments with and things. Okay. You go in, you have to usually have genetics tests before you do IVF in this country because morally they don't do genetics. They don't do IVF without genetics. Here. Mm-hmm. Okay. And because both me and my husband, Ashkenazi Jews, we're Eastern European Jews, we are unfortunately susceptible to more genetic problems than anything else. Ma- mostly what, anemia, right? Or... No, it's Tay-Sachs oh, and Tay-Sachs, things right. like that. Mm-hmm. And God, the list was endless. And it's gonna th- you have to pay for them as well. It's not cheap. Okay. Um. So once you've got those results, and you have to wait three months for your genetics results as well, you know. Mm-hmm. I went back to it this March. I think there were another four genetics tests I had to go for before I could do that. So I went back in January, did the genetics test, and then I had to have more hormone blood tests because I hadn't done it for a couple of years. Yeah. Right? So we went back to it, and what happens is, is you go on the second day of your period, you have to go for an internal um, scan and a blood test. Right? Okay. Then around midday, anything between 12 and 2, the nurse gives you a call and they call you and say, okay, this is what you have to do tonight. This is what you have to do tomorrow. Come back in for a blood test the day after or whenever it is they want. You have to write it down based on your protocol sheet. Are you uh, are you shaking your boots when you're giving you these instructions? Like, are they At the e- first time I did. Are they easy to follow? Yeah. Okay. I speak in Hebrew now as well. Okay. Very impressed by that. <laughs> right, because it's familiarity. The more I'm doing it, the more I'm right. talking. So right. it's actually helping my Hebrew yeah, I mean, a lot. That's, that's actually a good point because you can you can show up to a doctor's office and they speak, you know, a zillion miles a minute. Mm-hmm. And if it's a different language, there's all this jargon, medical jargon. That you exactly. Just not, and, it freaks and the you body out. parts. And yeah, you're like, what, what did I miss? Oh it my freaks God. you out. I mean, yeah. Your head becomes this big ball of mess and you yeah. just can't see front nor back. Right. And you can think, if I miss something, oh my God, the whole process is going to go wrong. Exactly. And, and no one's here to help it, hold my hand and all that. Yeah. The yeah. very first time I did this. I didn't get explained. I came into this whole process very, very, very naive. Mm. This was back in 2018. The woman, because of her Hebrew, she was Russian, my nurse, she told me something that didn't re- correlate to my protocol sheet and didn't even correlate to what my EpiPen had on it. Oh, no. And no one was, and you, are not, you can only call the nurses between a certain hour of the day. Mm. We are in Israel. Mm-hmm. So it's between 12 and 2 on a daily basis. Wow. And I had to do this injection that night. <sighs> so I bombed it down to the um, Yigalalon. I was crying by the by the reception desk because no one would see me. The doctors are all being seen by people. The, the nurses didn't want to see me. The reception staff back then were a bit arsy. So luckily there was a British woman there who took pity on me and she told me, no, this is what you're meant to do. It goes on your protocol sheet, which is something I knew. There's also other stuff I didn't know. It, it, all I can say to anyone who's going into the IVF process, research and yeah. ask questions. I went into it blind. And so fast forward to this year. Yeah. I The reason why I say 12 days is because the first cycle, March's cycle and June's cycle mm-hmm. were exactly the same. So I ended up doing um, one, two, two injections a day for the first sort of three or four days. Okay. And then three injections a couple of days later. And then obviously I'm going in and out the, the hospital, finding out exactly what's going on with me and how many follicles I'm producing. All of these injections, they're all hormone injections. They're all trying to produce follicles, which you hope have eggs inside. Mm-hmm. A follicle is a follicle. 
if the egg's inside, it's a bonus. So what you're trying to do is each side of your ovary is creating all these different follicles, which is essentially like a little bubble. Yeah. And the bigger they get, the better. And the minute they get to, I think it's two and a half millimetres. No, sorry. 25 millimetres or two centimetres and a half. Mm -hmm. That is when... um, they, they tell you to start getting ready for the egg retrieval because wow. they need to be a certain size or over. If they're smaller than that, there's nothing in there. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. So, so it's actually quite, there's a few steps here. Before even taking out the eggs, yeah. Right, that that you have to, I mean, you've, you've just got to survive mentally, right? Like you've got... And a, pray and hope that these follicles will get mm, eggs. Mm. And, you, and you're at the point now where you know the magic numbers below a certain threshold not going to work no because well, well, it doesn't what? matter i've discovered a lot i'd say in the last six months i've discovered more about the treatment than i ever have beforehand i was so naive so naive about mm-hmm. it mm-hmm. um just because you're injecting yourself with hormones and stuff it's not a guarantee that you're going to get an, an, an even an egg and and the jargon they use here it does sound a bit like passing the buck kind of mentality or even it it does sound like to me that they don't know what it is. But I have a friend of mine who's going through a similar thing and she's got something called uh, unexplained fertility. And they called mine, they called mine low fertility. So do you get what I'm saying? It's that mentality we think, how can you call it that? Is there not a name for it? Is there not a disease that's the reason why I'm doing this like this? Why Why am I going through this? And that's another frustrating thing because there is no name for it. Just low fertility. You have low fertility. Just like. But what do you mean? I thought, I thought they did identify the, the issue. It, the, the issue is what I've got, right. but they, there's no name for it. It's like you have low fertility, but we can't explain why and pinpoint exactly what is causing the issue. The reason why I can't physically ovulate is because of the endometriosis. It's mm-hmm. not the reason why I can't get pregnant. Okay. That's a completely different thing. Okay. Um, my eggs are old. I'm 39. My eggs are old. Right. Um, my husband has got, well, four years ago, I'll give you an example. He's, they told him he had super sperm four years ago. Now it's like a river. It's up and down. One day, once he can have good, next he can have bad. Mm-hmm. And I think... It has got a lot worse over the last four years because I'm now going in for egg retrieval in every cycle rather than taking enough out to um, fertilise and then freeze. I'm not creating enough viable eggs. Like, it's gone up by two pretty much every time I've gone in. So the first time around this year, uh, this year it was. So March I did, did it get seven or eight and then July, I got nine. And then the one after that, I got 11. And then this last cycle we just was 12. But of all, all of those, I only have been getting two viable eggs and embryos out of that. Mm-hmm. Only two. Do you, every time the number went up, did you get like a... Hope? Yeah. Yeah, always. You don't know until you've woken up from your egg retrieval how many eggs you've received. And then you don't know until you go back in to have them put back in whether any of them were were fertilized. How do you sleep? I don't. You don't, yeah. How can you? Your mind I'm being... I'm I run on coffee. Your I mind live on coffee. I, I my mind constantly I, running? Always. I I I'm um, I try. I, I I really, really try. But you have to remember, TV, commercials, radio, your environment, everything involves children. Anything you see involves children. Mm. I've worked with kids for three years, yeah. you know? Yeah. So I, I'm, I think that's my coping mechanism was working with children and being surrounded by kids and things like that is how I dealt with where Elliot couldn't do anything like that. He can't be around kids unless he, you know, he wants a child so badly. But my mind, I, I, I don't sleep very well at all. Let's talk a little bit about Elliot. Because mm-hmm. uh, r- rightfully so. I mean, <laughs> Jesus, the focus really is, mm-hmm. is on you, but 
he's there and he's yeah he's there with you every step of the way yep um is it is it a similar process with him emotionally and emotionally and mentally yeah um he is my he he is what he is he's my mental punching bag because as a woman <laughs> You go through enough hormones anyway at the best of times, but when you're pumping your body full of hormones, the poor man is the brunt of my mood swings. Yeah. You know? And yeah. he can't do anything about it. He can't bear seeing me the way I am. I could be a really happy, happy, happy person, which I try to be. I try and let my mind work better when I'm doing this so I'm really conscious of what my behaviour is. Mm -hmm. But sometimes... You get to a certain point where everything just gets too much. And yeah. I can be on a bus and I'd get either anxious or frustrated or aggravated at the smallest thing. And I can feel the heat from the back of my legs going and getting me wound up. I have to get off the bus. Right. Because it's just constantly. On and that, it's not me. Yeah. Yeah. There's only, there's only so much stuff you can store in your head at the same time. It was like a cartoon. It honestly yeah. feels like, you know, when the steam comes out of a cartoon yeah. character's ears? Yeah. I, I honestly have found myself walking a lot more during my process than mm. I have done in the past. Just that's, because I need good. to be by myself sometimes. Yeah. But you know, it's um, it's tough, I can imagine, for, for Elliot. But it's a hell of a compliment. You're paying him. Yeah. He like, is my rock. Yeah. He's yeah. my best friend. Yeah. He, you know, no one's perfect and I'm not perfect. And, yeah. you know, we have issues like every other married couple would do. Yeah. But if you're an, out, an outsider looking in, a lot of people, our friends say to us, they admire us as a couple and they aspire to be like us as a couple. We're mm -hmm. not the perfect couple by any stretch of the imagination. Yeah. Um, but I think the strength that we show each other and the respect that we show each other it's second to none. It's yeah. I married my best friend and yeah. somebody who thankfully is so empathetic towards my situation and I'm empathetic towards him and I say it all the time. All the time. But it's also it's like you trust him enough that no matter what terrible thing you say to him, he knows he knows exactly what's going on or or, or or pretty damn close to what you're going through and so it's like a lot forgiving. It's like it's all it's all in a circle there of love. There is a lot he forgives me for. Yeah. There are some things he will bite back to because I can be such a nasty little <laughs> bitch at times. But <laughs> I don't. It's all it's all venom and it's all um, yeah. frustrations and it doesn't happen all the time. It really right. doesn't. Right. But I think as well. I I speak to a therapist bi weekly as well, which helps. Yeah. Um. And I, I plead anybody going through the IVF process to speak to a therapist. It, it, even if you don't think you need to, you need to unload on somebody that isn't your partner because it's just, they already get enough. Yeah, you need you need a neutral party. That Outsider, you can, yeah. Because at least they are paid to deal with the load of, you know, whatever vitriol you're at. Yes. Time, right? <laughs> or yeah. the partner is like stuck there and, and, and wants to be there, of course. Exactly. But, yeah. So, yeah. um, but how, I mean, does, does he have low moments as well? Oh yeah. Yeah. With you or beside you, like you have your low, low moments, he's there to prop you up and then he sort of goes down. Yeah. I'd say it's, it's never it's together. Very rare. I mean, we have, I like to call it grieving moments. So when I get told, <laughs> yeah, more often, obviously I'm not pregnant. When I get told that, that I'm not successful, I have my rest of the day to grieve and then the next day is a new day and we're like, yep, what are we doing now? Wow. Let's get on with it. Let's wow. do this. Let's get on. Wow. Because there is only, listen, I, I, I'm a reasonably positive person. This whole process makes me a negative person. So for me to push myself out my boundaries of being negative when all this is going on and be positive again, it kind of gives me that lift and belief again in that, it can go on because I am very back and forth after it. Do I go on again? Can I do this again? And I'm having arguments all day long. But Elia, genuinely, you know, he's already got it in his head. We're not going to be parents. He's already got it into his head so that he's not going to be disappointed when it doesn't happen. 
Uh, if it doesn't happen. Is he not naturally a pessimistic person? Yeah. The only thing he's actually optimistic about is Tottenham Hotspurs. The rest of the time it's not. <laughs> and if you look at Tottenham Hotspurs, you would know. Yeah. You shouldn't be optimistic about that. Okay. My husband is very much a pessimist. Always has been. But as a defense mechanism as well? Possibly. Possibly. To be to Yeah, I think it hurt. could be. And it does wind me up a little bit, but at the same time yeah. his pessimism is Possibly what keeps me a lot more grounded. Mm. You can't be an optimist with everything. I think sometimes, realistically, he keeps me grounded and it helps. So D- Duff and I are exactly the same, but we're the opposite. So yeah. I'm, I'm the optimist, she's the pessimist. Yeah. And it pisses me off sometimes. Yeah. Me off as well. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's just, you need that real- reality check and you need your partner to be that person because they're the only ones that can look at you and shake you by the shoulder and say, Look, we need to get through this. And it's like a snip in the head hmm. and the, the light goes on. You're like, okay, this is the person you love. This is the person who, yeah. no matter what, will yeah. be with you, has seen you in your airs and graces and all of that kind of stuff. He'll love you no matter what. I mean, as I said, I said to you just now, he's already got it in his head that we're not going to have a baby and that we're going to go on around the world trip when we're in our 60s. So, you know... Anything going forward now is a bonus. Have you ever considered adoption? Yes. Um, unfortunately, now it's a bit more of a pipe dream here because adoption isn't very easy in this country. It's extremely complicated. Listen, I know it's in a complicated at the best of times. But here, as far as I understand and have read, it's all pretty open adoptions. Par- so the parents who have given up their child for adoption, have a right to have a either a part of their life, not necessarily a part physically, but they get letters and pictures and things like that, still in contact mm. with the parent. It's almost like foster caring, to be honest, in my how I see it. Okay. Uh, in the and UK. What, what about that turns you off? I haven't, I haven't given this much thought, so I'm just curious. What turns me off about that is it feels messy and complicated Mm -hmm. and something like that shouldn't be that complicated you're giving a child a home that is unwanted let's face it a child who has been put out for adoption is an unwanted child yeah and the fact that you're opening your door to give this child a home what right does the mother and father of this child who have already decided they can't take care of this child anymore what right do they have until this child is 18 whether they can go and look for their parents or not what right do they have? That's how I see it. Mm-hmm. In the UK, everyone says to me, oh, can't you go and do it from the UK? Well, no. Um, when you're in the UK and you're adopting, you have to foster for a certain amount of time first and then get assessed by the uh, government or whoever it is. I think it's the government that puts children and places children with yeah. parents. Yeah. Here, as well as it being complicated, what makes it even more complicated is you have to be a certain age before they allow you to have a child of a certain age. What age is that? Right, okay, let's use L. Elle. Elle's going to be 42 in December. Mm-hmm. If one of you are 42 or over at the time of processing the adoption, you get a child a year older. So you can only have a one-year-old and above. Okay. Right, because he's 42. So you get an older child the older that you are because oh wow it makes sense really it does make sense because right. you don't want to have a, a sixty year old with a one year old baby who's gonna for use of a better word pop it in twenty odd years you know what I mean it's just yeah. not fair on the child really <laughs> so I in in yeah. actual fact here if you get a child with a disability it's easier to adopt which doesn't bother me. Doesn't bother. I would take happily an Ethiopian child. I would happily take a child with disabilities, no problem. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, we're living in quite a racist area. Like, Israel is quite a racist country to an effect in some places. And, and that's the other off putting thing. I can't bear having a child who's an Ethiopian baby because I would just take one. I'd take 10. <laughs> I would. They're the most, oh, love them. I would take 10 Ethiopian children if I could. If, if, they weren't going to be embarrassed seeing a white couple pick them up from school. Well, where's about the colour of the skin? It's uh, it's the reality of what the world we're living in. Happens in England as well. I, I don't know. I, I So my oldest, 
he had black kids in his class and I don't think it was a thing. It's not so much a thing. It's more to do. It's not not the bullying of the black child. It's the bullying of the child who's got the black uh, the black child with the white parent. Oh, I see. Okay. The kids gonna know automatically it's been adopted. Right, right. It's right. just it's okay. It's okay. kids are cruel. Yeah, yeah. I've watched a program on. Um, please don't judge me for saying this. Netflix called Bling Empire. Right. <laughs> I love it because it's television while you eat your dinner kind of stuff, right? While you're eating your supper, you're sitting there watching crap. I mean, the title uh, suggests, but tell me. Uh... It's about um, <laughs> the Asian population in LA. It's a bit like uh, I, Housewives I, of Beverly Hills and all of that kind, that kind of docu series. Well, I still feel like I'm missing a little bit of information. What are the Asians in LA? They're rich as hell. <laughs> They've got so much money. I mean, okay, um Guy Tang is a hairdresser and he's part of the show. So it's all of the Asian uh, community. Yeah. One of the guys in the last episode I watched was talking about his adoption. Okay. And growing up as an uh, Asian man in America. To the point, because his parents were white, he had his eyes fixed because he was born with one eyelid eye because of his Chinese back heritage. Mm -hmm. He had his eyes, his eyelids fixed because he was being bullied. So he did look more like a Caucasian person. Yeah. You see, that's exactly yeah. what I mean. Yeah. I may be going around it the wrong way, yeah. but as amazing as it would be for me to take on an adoption, I can't bear the thought of this child being persecuted because of the color of his skin and you think you would feel guilty about that i'd be bullied for it as well you'd be bullied of course i would why i've seen it my you... own two eyes in israel i've seen it i've seen parents with adopted children here in um something tells me that you're not the kind of person to suffer bullies very lately well i was bullied a lot at school so i don't suffer i don't take crap for anyone anymore but when you've got a child involved, it's different. Yeah. You have to show a certain way. You have to mm. be a certain person. Mm -hmm. I have to be a certain role model. And if I was to take, say I had a, a, an Ethiopian adopted child and I wanted to put this Ethiopian adopted child into a really lovely Jewish school mm -hmm. and this Ethiopian child is the only or second black child in the school and then they see this white women coming to pick her up and kiss and cuddle. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah. The world we live in. Yeah, yeah. Kids, kids will see Kids them. are bastards. Yeah. I was. We all were. Yeah. Yeah, of course. So. Of course. That's my main issue with it. I guess the only, I mean, I follow you all the way there. The only counterpoint is like, well, what happens to that kid if no one else steps up? That's the other, and yeah. that's something I have to put out the back of my mind yeah. because if I don't, I I would be up twenty four seven, yeah. and it does, yeah. it does yeah. cross my mind a lot. Yeah. It's just an option at this time. Yeah. No, you got to keep going. Like, I, I'm gonna keep going yeah. because I'm 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 just at the point now of my life where it's it, it I, I, it's too soon for me to think about things like that right now. Okay. So I've given myself an age limit anyway to carry on the process. I've I'm said about 41, 42. If I haven't conceived by then, then I'm saving for my round the world trip. So, you know, <laughs> got to be done. Um, yeah, there's, there's something, you know, to, to stare at. Okay. So a couple of weeks ago, or maybe it was even a couple of months ago, there was this article that I read on Bloomberg. Um, and it was like the headline was something like, um, single women are, are getting wealthier in America. Right. And the, and the first paragraph was describing this woman. She was, I think she was 43 and she says she's not married, doesn't have kids and she has a message for everyone and you can have everything you want. And, you know, I, I read that and like I had a split reaction, which the first one was, yeah, okay, you know, if that works for you, fine. Right. But then I was, I, I couldn't help but be really annoyed by reading that paragraph and i would have been as well because it's like encouraging women to go but, out and get everything they want be business minded get all the money you want and then look back at your life at the age of 50 and think fuck i'm not married i've got no kids oh but i've got loads of money yeah yeah so so the, the everything that you want in life was uh, an apartment in manhattan and a holiday house in new jersey now 
Great. How big's the apartment in Bad Hatton? <laughs> right. Again, I don't want to make fun of this woman. Like, no. Like, if that's, if really that's cool for her. Each to their own. Amazing. You know, like, yeah. if she found her, if she found her sweet spot in life, fantastic. But, you know, there's, there's only, there's got to be only like a few of us out there that can really manage a life without kids. You know, like there's this comedian that I really like. His name is Bill Maher. He's never been married, you know? Okay. He's never been married, never had kids. And, you know, he, he rails on about how terrible life is as a married person and so on and so forth. And it's like, yeah, you're Bill Maher. <laughs> Everyone wants to hang out with you. And if you don't want to hang out with anyone, fine, no big deal. You're alone, no big deal. But how many people have that kind of life where, you know, there's all this responsibility and people really want to hear what this man thinks and so they invite him over to their house or to this parties or god knows what mm. how many of us are, are are that life and soul type of person well i yeah i don't know like you know you have to be a certain person i yeah. think i know too many people that say they hate children but they love their own and mm. i think you have to already have got it in your head and be in a life partnership with somebody who's also at the same like-mindedness as you. Mm -hmm. So you said that Bill Maher's married, right? So no, not married. Not married. Never been married. So he is happy yeah. like that. Sure. Never wanted to get married, never wanted children. Hates kids. So he says. So he says. Yeah. Um... I know plenty of women who have, as I said, gone on to have children of their own without a partner. Mm -hmm. Again, hates children but loves their own. <laughs> you know, it's just, it just depends on the type. I, I actually don't think it depends on the type of person. I think you either want to have kids or you don't. I think that's just how it is. And I think the people who don't want to have children shouldn't be encouraging the people that, of the rest of the world to say, well... I've got this house and I've got that house and I've got... Because even like the celebrities, like... Um, who hasn't had a baby? I think it's Sandra Bullock. Not Sandra Bullock. Kylie Minogue. Because okay. she doesn't openly talk about the fact that she doesn't want kids or maybe mm. she couldn't have them. I don't know what her story is. Okay. She's gone through her life singing and being an actress or whatever didn't even cross my mind about her becoming a mother and I didn't even think of myself like, oh, if I, I want to be a famous rock star, I can be like, yeah, no children. Right. But then you've got other people like this woman who are saying to people, oh, well, you can have it all. You just got to work really hard and everything else. And yeah. a lot of this has stemmed from the late 90s as well. Women have become more and more independent, more and more less reliant on men. And I think the Spice Girls had a big part to do with that. And <laughs> okay. seriously, okay. I think girl power and the 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 equality between men and women yeah. and society stopped telling you to become a mother and to go out and start working and earning your own money and becoming this independent woman. Yeah. The family structures got lost. Yeah. Yeah. So that's why more and more women are in and, their 40s having babies. And which is cool. Yes, of course it is. It's like, absolutely fine. The thing also is what i i fear might be happening is like so you have ivf mm -hmm. you know and like that's like a in in your back pocket as you build your career yeah it's like if if uh, if i ever you know hit into a bumpy patch and i need help okay like at least i have that option available to mm -hmm. me and it's true that is true um it's just as we outlined in, you know over the last hour here like it's not a walk in the park it's it's it's, it's excruciating i i bet um, um and it and it doesn't guarantee success no Really um, not. Really not. I, I, listen, as I said before, you'll wake up from your egg retrieval and don't even know if you've got any eggs that were yeah, okay. Yeah. You're just suspended in time. Literally. Waiting for the fucking, you know, word from on high to hit you and say yes, no. Exactly. Right. So March is an example. Really good example. So March, when I went back to it, I I was getting to a point where I was doing a lot more research. I didn't want to go back into this completely blind. Mm -hmm. I did more research about what was going to happen to me, about what was going to happen to me after, if I felt pregnant, mm -hmm. whatever. So March, I went back to it, did 12 days. I went into my retrieval and I woke up from that retrieval finding out I got nine eggs. Mm -hmm. I went back on the following Sunday to have 
whatever how many eggs put back in that have been fertilized. Out of those nine, as I said to you before, I've had two, two, two. Right. So two were viable and they were they get graded as well. Okay. They get graded between one and five, one being the best. Okay. Um, I can't remember what grade March's eggs were or embryos were, but it wasn't number one, put it that way. And I actually was successful in March. I fell pregnant. Oh. Yeah, I did fall pregnant, but I did miscarry at three and a half, four weeks. So that's, I lost it afterwards. Oh, so it's the first time. Listen, it's all good. You have to be positive about these things. I can get pregnant. No, I'm I'm just... I'm it's just, all good. I'm taken to that moment where you, the news is delivered that you're pregnant. And then subsequently... I, I did a pregnancy test as well. I've never seen a, a positive pregnancy test in my life. I've took oh a picture of it God. and kept it on my phone. But it, I was actually pregnant with my sisters as well for three weeks, oh which was incredible. Gosh. So wow. when I got told... Because you go... When you get your eggs put back in, mm -hmm. your embryos, you have to wait for two weeks. It's called the two-week wait, ironically. Um, I'd say it's probably the worst two weeks of your of your life. I bet. You have to sit on your hands. You can't do pregnancy tests. You have to avoid certain foods. You have to avoid doing certain things. can't slap more than five kilograms. You can't. Mm -hmm. There's so much you can't do. So many don'ts, but not so many do's. And I found myself really taking care of myself during those two weeks in March, mm -hmm. then you go for a blood test. And what that blood test does is it tests your HCG levels, which is your hormone levels to tell you whether you're pregnant. Mm -hmm. And I got the phone call later on that afternoon, tell me that I was pregnant to carry on doing all the drugs that I was doing, but it was a low pregnancy and to come in two days later for a blood test. So even put aside the fact that you've gone and done your injections for 12 days, then you're doing your egg retrievals. You're not knowing what's going on there. And then you go back in for your transfer and then getting told while you're laying on that bed how many eggs out of those, how many embryos have been yeah. fertilized out of those eggs. Your journey doesn't end after two week wait. You're right. pregnant. Right. Then you have to go for blood tests to make sure that your levels or your progesterone levels are rising, which is the thing that keeps the baby in there and mm -hmm. the HCG. Mm -hmm. Then you have to go in for two weeks later for a, a scan to check the heartbeat. And then you've got to keep that thing alive for nine months, eight months after that. It is so much harder than a, just a standard pregnancy. It's it's yeah. it's a chemical pregnancy. That's what it is. You're literally pushing yourself to get pregnant. Are you? What you have to take? Uh, you have to keep on injecting yourself. Um, the after you do things like um, there are things called trigger shots. And your trigger shots are usually what you take 36 hours before your egg retrieval. Okay. Okay. It's the thing that releases all the follicles that you're able to take them out. I have to do my, I think we're changing it up this side when I do my next cycle. I think we're changing it a little bit. But I had to do those trigger shots again after the uh, implantation. And I'm, I don't know what it means. I just get told what to do and I do it. Mm -hmm. um, we were successful in March and then I haven't been successful since. But it's got steadily worse as the months have gone on. So July, I, w I think July, July I got two grades. No, I, July I got one. No, they told me I had two, but only one was okay. Mm -hmm. And then the worst cycle was the one I did starting in June, actually, that one. So the one I did in June, July was the worst cycle because I actually had to do injections. I did 48 injections over 31 days. Wow. They put me into what he called a simulated menopause. They were trying to wake up my ovaries. So um, I don't know if anyone out there watches Kardashians, but this is what Chloe, uh, Courtney Kardashian went through, which okay. she's trying to go through IVF and at the moment with her husband, Travis Barker. So it can bloat you it can oh god my stomach was blue and purple because these injections that i was taking were different to what i was used to and they were they were painful they tell you to ice your stomach before you take them wow so for, for 31 days give or take i was doing three in one day at one point and taking a pill my god 
And I did it at a wedding as well. My friend got married. It was the first time I did all three injections. I had to go and get undressed in the room. My husband yeah. had to come up with me. That's 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 interesting when you have to go out somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Take everything with you. Yeah, exactly. Like y- y- you you might f- find yourself injecting yourself at a restaurant or a wedding or uh, did a wedding yeah. on an apparently you can take it on an airplane. <laughs> airplane, my god. Yeah. Yeah. That's the only thing actually stopping me from going to the UK because I don't know what's happening to me from one month to the next. I haven't seen my family in four and a half years. So uh, it's just partly because my doctor could say to me, I could be doing injections again for the whole month again. I hope he doesn't. I can't do that again. But, you know, I just, I can't commit to flying anywhere. Wow. Because, and it kills me because I've got a niece and a nephew that are yeah. brand new. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to hug my family. I can't. I've made, people tell me I'm not selfish. But I feel like I've made a very selfish decision to stay here in order to get pregnant. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't sacrificing see that. family. No, I don't see that at all. No, I, I personally, that, but I'm hard on myself anyway. Sure. So I personally think so. But when I talk to my clients about it, my friends, I say to me, "What are you being selfish for? You're not being selfish. Right. You're doing what you want to do for a change. You put everyone else first. It's also, you know." You want to be a mother. Yeah. It's You could look at that as being selfish, but you're taking on a hell of a commitment. I've, I'd have say to plenty of people that I'm a hairdresser, but I was put on this planet to be a mum. Yeah, you're, you're, you could, you could tell that you, it's so, so when you cut um, my kid's hair, mm-hmm. right? It's you, they, they kind of melt a little bit when, with you. Oh, Manu. Oh my God, Manu. No, but all of them. I know. Eli, well... Elias can actually hold a conversation with now he's a bit older, which okay. is great. Manu, he'll try and talk to me and tell me what's going on on the team. And he, I love your kids because they just sit, because they know me anyway. You yeah. know, I used to look yeah. after him. So, yeah. uh, but when I cut Elias's hair the other day, the fact that he's got to see me a lot as well, it's easy. Your kids are so easy. You yeah, know? Yeah, yeah. No, but I love you, them. You have a way with them because, you know, other people call them handsome. No one calls them gorgeous. Oh my God, they're Just gorgeous. <laughs> oh, I could eat all three of your children and you're Elias with these eyes, like bright blue eyes. Oh my God. Oh goodness. No, but yeah. So, okay. So I, d- I had this weird thought um, when I was thinking about you. So there are there's another class of people that traditionally, of course, couldn't have kids. And now it's, it's kind of become a thing, which is gay people. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. Um, Big advocate, by the way. True. Pisses me off that you can't be a surrogate in this country for a gay person. Yeah. Fuck me off. But yeah. 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 Um, and, you know, I, 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 I would hesitate to say that their lives are not as fulfilled as everyone else's. Like, that, that doesn't sound right to me. You no. know what I mean? Like, maybe it's because they think, well, I was never in the, in the cards to begin with. But I, I don't know. Okay, so I hate the word gay. I hate the word lesbian. Okay. I can't bear someone being generalised for who they choose to love. I think um, no one says anything to you because you're married to Daphna, because you're straight. Oh, you're straight, so you're happy. And your life should be fulfilled because you're straight. I have this conversation with my gay friends all the time. I hate Mm -hmm. using that word. He's just a friend, you know? Yeah. I hate putting labels on things as well, personally. But, well, hold on. Hang on a second. First of all, of course, I mean absolutely nothing negative by it. No, of just, course. Just, of course. No, no. I'm just saying yeah, how yeah. I feel. Mm-hmm. Whether you are married to a woman and you're a woman yourself or whether you're married to a man or a man yourself, shouldn't mm-hmm. matter whether you want a child or not. If you want to bring mm-hmm. life into this world and you are capable of looking after this child, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean you have to have every money, every single pound or dollar in your pocket yeah if you know in your heart of hearts that you're going to be an excellent parent whether you're married to someone of the opposite sex or you're single or married to somebody of the same sex should be here nor there anyone Mm -hmm. that wants to have a child should have a child sure but i'm just saying the only thing i was trying to raise was that 
for for a long time, gay couples didn't have kids. Now that's changing. Of course, right? I love it, and that's cool. Love it, really cool. you know. Yeah. I've got a, again a few of my clients. One of my favorite clients. They've just moved back to the states. They were mm. both in the military, working for the uh, embassy, the American embassy. Mm-hmm. They had two children, a little girl and a little boy. These, been, these are men or these are women? women? Women, okay. One had the girl, one had the boy. Okay. Right? That's how they're keeping their connection together. Same sperm donor as far as I believe. Okay. It just worked. And they were just the most incredible parents. And then on the other side I've got as well, I've got uh, a pair of men. They've got two boys. Use the same mother as a surrogate. Cool. It should be more available here, but it isn't because of, unfortunately, the religion that we are part of. It's not something, it is very much frowned upon, although we are in the 21st century. That's what I was saying before. We're in 1950s and some things and 2022 and others. Mm -hmm. Technology wise, yes, we're in 2022. Mm -hmm. Life in general, banks, (laughs) the way that you choose to live your life, whether you're straight, gay, bisexual, whatever you want to do. It's judged. I don't know. I, I, again, I have I have in in two of my kids' classes, I have um, gay parents with with uh, kids in the class. You're in Tel Aviv, right? <laughs> Actually, and, you know, it was really cool. It was really really cool, and I wonder if there's a connection here. So, like, I I thought about it. Like, what does it mean to be gay, right? And um. I've, I've said this before in a, in a different conversation I had here, but like there, there's this thing that uh, this comedian Dave, Dave Chappelle once said. And he went to this art high school, artsy mm-hmm. high school, uh, like a yeah arts. So like a what they call you know it? stand up for comedy for yeah, plays yeah, yeah, for yeah. dancing you know stuff like that, music. And he was uh, in one of his comedy specials. He was um, you know he was uh, imitating one of the people in in, uh, in his school, and he was. You know, he was so he was obviously overdoing it, right? Like the whole gay posture. And, yeah, yeah. Right. And um and he said something that was really profound. He said, you know, I mean they the the gay kids in his school um were fighting for their right to be who they already knew, whereas everyone else was fighting for the right to find out who they are. You know? Gay people have got their heads screwed on, but Right, because yeah, they they know more. They know more, right? And yep. so, and so, and it's also really interesting because, so in my eldest class, there's a girl and she's got two dads and this girl is like a fucking rock star. You know, she's going in there, she's got makeup on, she's got loud clothes. Like, she's just like, I'm a queen. I'm a, you know, get the fuck out of my way. Like yeah. <laughs> they're more grounded and are in touch with their identity. Yeah. I wonder if there's like a, definitely, I that, agree. I think there really is. I really do. I think. I think you have to be and understanding that you're not coming from a secular family like a, um, an organic family that would be organic in the sense of the outside world. You're living in your own world and it shouldn't be like that. It, 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 there shouldn't be, society shouldn't tell you that there should be a mummy and a daddy and 2.4 children. Shh. Sure, although it is hard to get away from the mommy and daddy bit. Right? Yeah, because I know you need both to make a baby. Yeah, yeah. Doesn't necessarily mean you have to have both in the family to be... Yeah, no, thing. Sure. That's how. That's where I start to get pissed off because in the rest of the world it's fine. I find it hard here. It, again, if you're not in Tel Aviv. <laughs> right, right. Right. Jerusalem has it really bad. Like, okay, Pride in Tel Aviv is the most incredible thing. It's so fun. Right. Jerusalem, it's like a quick parade. Get through quick, quick, quick. Yes, we're, you know. Yeah. And that's it because they're scared. Yeah. It may, it does. I still though wonder why, like when I, when I see that girl and she's just like really showing all her colors and it's like, man, good, good for you. Like that girl, she's. Dad's probably like that as well. Then I, I have no idea. I, I met one of them, and he he was like pretty normal. Yeah, you know, he, he was actually kind of. But when they're at home, 
<laughs> not pretty normal. Normal is, is uh, no, 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 no. I know what you you're know what saying. Mean. Just like uh, not standard fine. dad. Yeah, no. Just like no, nothing. Some pick him up from school, go nothing. home, play second park. No, right. I know what you mean. I didn't think like that guy walks around with assless chaps in his house. Like that. That's what yeah. I mean. Yeah. Right? No. <laughs> no. What yeah. I think will probably be happening at home is she's allowed to be this free spirit girl that she wants to be, yeah. and she's allowed to pick her own clothes. And I love that right. when a kid has individuality. Right. Because like imagine that probably their her dad's had people telling maybe might have had people telling them like no you're not that and they're like no 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 I, be I, whatever you want right, to be right, 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 yeah right, right, right and so yeah. as a parent you're like no I'm not doing that to my mm-hmm. kid yeah yeah exactly yeah, yeah yeah and I think we all do that we all say oh well I'm not going to do this to my kid because my parents did this to me right, right. and I, I you know I'm still li- yet to live the yeah the parenting role but I look at I look at things that my sisters are doing mm-hmm. and it's interesting for me because I see the ways, because they've got partners, you know, their partners have already got their own ways of doing things as well. So you're bringing two different people together anyway mm-hmm. that have got their own ways of doing yeah. things and yeah. you can see, again, it's, it, is it nature over nurture or is it, is it what you've picked up as being in the real world, what you've picked up from your mum, yeah. what you've picked up from your sister. It, it could be so many different things that could create that atmosphere. Yeah. This little girl, same thing. What she reads, what she watches, what mm. she listens to, mm. what she sees her parents doing. Yeah. She could, like my sister, the youngest one, grew up to be a chef because my granddad taught her how to cook. No, she had that special relationship. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's to you. Think. This is going to be a weird, a weird question, but do you do you communicate with your child to be? Do you ever fantasize? And of course, I know what names I'm going to have already. I know, I I, I know I don't want to be living in Tel Aviv once I've had a baby. Uh, okay. Um, there is no way I'm sending my kids to school in Tel Aviv. I know that, but okay. I know that I don't know what they're going to look like. I have they, more than one. I would love more than one. Okay. I mean, I'm hoping I can get two in one go and be done with it. You know, <laughs> it also depends on my age. One, I'd be very happy with. I'd be absolutely ecstatic with one, yeah. but two, you know, it's incredible because you've got yeah, a brother yeah, or a sister yeah, growing yeah, up yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I would rather give my whole entire life to a one child than have to put myself through this too many times. So, right, right, right. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know what they're going to look like when I dream about it kids got blank face they've got no hair or nothing but i see a child in my future i just don't know when yeah wow yeah it's amazing like where 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 our minds can go right i mean we all fantasize about it, whatever stuff in the we've future. all got an imagination yeah yeah it's just how far away it goes with you and how much you actually let yourself imagine um, I'm a huge believer in positive mental attitudes. Mm-hmm. Um, I was suffered with depression for many years and I stopped taking my antidepressants because I didn't like the way they made me feel and I went cold turkey. And I started waking up every day and saying, today's going to be a good day. And I went out and started to get things that I wanted. And I started, my mentality was, I will go out and get what I want. I will work hard for it. And a couple of people, well, my mum's told me before that one of my sisters has said that at one point she got pissed off because the expression, I would fall in shit and come out smelling of roses. Okay. And the reason is, is that I would end up on my backside with something that went wrong. But I would always push myself out of it to get myself back to where I needed to be. And I think the positive mental attitude is a huge part of that. Yeah, yeah. And I learned how to be that person. I never was. It's um, it's it's really something to f- really um, understand, but like fully to have a have this two insights on board. W- one is is that life is suffering, right? Oh yeah, very. So because then once you realize that it doesn't really matter anymore, it's like okay, yeah. Well, what else was I supposed to get, right? Yep. And then the other thing is the worse the suffering, the more profound the answer to the, the antidote to the suffering will be yeah because that's the only way I you're going to get acceptance out acceptance as well yeah i think the word acceptance is a very key word here i think you need to accept through the fertility journey i think you need to accept that what the doctors are telling you 
is gospel. You have to just take what they tell you and run with it. Yeah. You don't know any better. The amount of research that comes up, it's so contradictory. You can go on. The worst thing you do is go on Google. Anyone knows that. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Google sucks for that stuff. It sucks balls. Yeah. Um, but I think if you believe that it's going to happen, then it will. And it just yeah. may not be my time right now, but the back and forth that I do go back through is worse during that two week wait. And then just afterwards when I haven't gone pregnant, I'm like, okay, can I do this again? But I get through it and I think what the bigger picture will eventually be. Mm. And it, it's all well and good that I've got people telling me, yeah, it will happen. It will happen. It will happen. But I do have, again, I said to you, I've given myself an age limit to 42, 41, 42. It will happen, may change to, it may happen. And then it might change to, mm, not sure if it will happen. And then it's not going to happen. And thankfully I have a doctor who I tell him to be realistic with me. Don't sugarcoat anything. I yeah. don't like anyone yeah. humoring me yeah. is the right word. So how, how do you feel though about those people who say, yeah, yeah, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Do you like that? Do you find that fucking annoying? I mean, what? what I you... just smile and nod night. No, it's, it was good at the beginning because it's nice to have other people that's positive but as I said to you right at the beginning of this chat yeah, unless you've gone through a cycle of IVF or you have a partner or your daughter or your sister is going through actually no not your daughter or your sister unless you are physically yourself going through a form of IVF you don't know you really don't you, it's the uncertainty it's the emotional wreck and to have people on the outside say oh it will happen believe in god believe in this believe in that i can't have that anymore i can't have people telling me that anymore it will happen i wish say to me oh i pray for you it will happen say to me mm. i'll keep you in my thoughts i'll keep you in my prayers which is incredible and it's so incredibly sweet and selfless of somebody to say that to you yeah but to turn around to say it will happen gives somebody false hope. Yeah. And you're already giving yourself enough false hope every time you're going in for your transfer. So you don't need any more false hope. My advice to anybody who is with a friend going through IVF, don't tell them it will happen. Don't mm. tell them that if you pray to God, it will happen. Don't tell them it will. There is nothing definite. Yeah. You have to say to them... I'll keep you in my prayers. Is there anything I can do for you? Can I take you out for a coffee? Can I talk to you? And I'll be totally honest with you. That's not what I've been getting. It's been getting a lot of, it will happen. Mm. It will happen. And both me and Elia goes, so fucked off. Excuse my <laughs> with it all. I'm just like, yeah, 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 yeah. And I know people mean well. Yeah. Just that little tweak of words yeah. is all it needs. I mean, I try different things. I did the mikvah which is the um, the bath that women go into is the only way to describe it uh, under a synagogue so that you become closer to God and you cleanse your body before you go into a cycle. I did that in March and I got pregnant. Wow. Right? Wow. So I am now on the 6th or the 4th of November. Here, a pregnant woman at nine months goes back to the mikvah, if you're, if you're that way inclined, and they dunk in the mikvah and there's someone who's trying to get pregnant usually goes in directly after them before okay. they've cleaned it, which okay. it sounds a bit minging, a bit gross. But the woman who told me about it had been trying for IVF for two, three years, didn't get successful. But the cycle after she did that, she got pregnant. She's got an eight-year-old now. If I, if I try to bring this down to earth, do you think that there's like some kind of meeting of the minds there. It's like, I went through this, I'm pregnant. I really think it's mind over matter. Like, hang in there. Spiritually. Yeah, yeah. When I came out of the mic for the first time, I felt just very peaceful. Mm. But I partly think that had to do with the fact that I had a lovely hot bath and I hadn't had a bath for about two years. I have showers. So it was a very relaxed bath for me. It was mm. a very, it's a very pampering experience going okay. into a mic for, for a woman. Um, you, I, a friend of mine spends hours in there. She gets to go in there and just be herself. She pampers herself. Mm. And do, spiritually, I, I'm I'm an atheist. I don't believe I've stopped believing in God a long time ago. Mm -hmm. 
I'd say more of late um, because, and I didn't fast on Yom Kippur as well because I just, I thought, you haven't given me a baby, what the hell am I believing in? But spiritually, I believe in a higher power and I believe if you allow yourself to believe in something, good things can happen. Mm. And if you want something that's so pure and so true, that it will happen. Why it hasn't happened for me yet, I don't know. I'm willing to try anything in my physical ability to get pregnant until a certain age that I will. Yeah. Um, at which point, I mean, there's only so much of your life you can change. You don't want your life to be completely unrecognisable from what you already have. I, I was reading books that made me want to think about giving up hairdressing because I couldn't use plastics and I couldn't use metal. And if you're a hairdresser, mm. that's pretty much what you got. Mm -hmm. So I've stopped allowing myself... That's the optimism. I've stopped allowing myself to be so much of an optimist and more of a realist. Okay. I think that's what so, I'm getting at. One thing I... I, I want to get back to that point because... But before I go there, I mean... Do you so so you ha you run your own business mm -hmm. right and um you uh, is there a part of you that thinks like obviously you like cutting hair and you like styling hair it's, you're good at it I love it right is there a part of you that thinks that you do this yeah you go to other people's homes they come to your to come to you for for haircuts and and, and because you want to set yourself up that you're involved in other people's other families lives for the rest of your life like as, as a sort of a community building thing or yeah people rely on you it's it's like you get to watch families grow exactly so it, in case that it doesn't happen for you it's as a hairdresser especially one that goes to the community and goes to people's houses you build this rapport and relationship up with your clients yeah so let's use you as an example you yeah. and daphna yeah I've known you guys since your eldest was in the kindergarten that I worked in. Right. Okay. So I've watched your eldest from the age of two. Yeah. And he's what now? Six. Yeah. For the last four years, I'd say probably the most important four years, I've watched him grow from this toddler. Right. To this potty trained kid to this little boy who goes to school. Yeah. And... I said last time I went around and cut his hair, I said, what are you doing growing so much? I can't believe how big he's got. Yeah. So you're watching Milestones. I'm looking at my longest standing client is here in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. I've been doing her hair since she started university. Oh, wow. She got married in June. Okay. I've been doing her hair for about 12, 13 years now. So you know her when she first met her. And now I know husband. the whole family. But you know also, you know the whole story. Yeah. I know you've, the love story. You've, you've I've seen, seen it blossom. blossom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, please God, she'll have children with him. Yeah. And yeah, we're all hoping for that. Um, <laughs> but when I look at clients, even in the UK, I, I, I'm still friends with them on Facebook and stuff. Like one of, the, I couldn't believe it that one of the girls that I used to do as she was still in primary school, I think, at nine years old, and she's now at university in Oxford University, and I'm just yeah. like. Whoa, yeah. kid! I used to babysit. It's just had a baby. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You you go through all these lifestyles with these people. You become unexpectedly part of their lives, but it's part of the package of part of being what I do. So you engulf yourself in that, and then you pick up things. Yeah, but it's also like I remember. So my mother used to take me and my my two sisters and I and herself. She would get a haircut. We'd mm -hmm. go to the salon run by two gay dudes or one gay dude and another gay dude was like his co-captain. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I used no. to be gay. No, it's all good. <laughs> Back then it was like, that's what it was. And it's not in Israel, but yeah. And, um, and you know, I, I couldn't connect because I was into sports and these guys weren't, you know, or whatever the hell I was. I was like 13, you know. Mm -hmm. But my sisters and my mother, like they would just chat and, and like they just knew stuff about their lives, you know, and, and it's such a hairdresser, hair, you know. Do you go role. to the salon? Yeah, you, you're part of that person's life, you know? I was and talking about this on good, Friday. The great conversation. Oh, yeah. yeah. So part of the reason why I have therapy myself is because people unload on me. <laughs> <laughs> I am an extremely good listener. Yeah. 
I think it's an important part of being a hairdresser because not only do you have to listen to what your client really wants, you're also there as a shoulder to cry on. And nine times out of ten, when people go to the hairdressers, it's their therapy session. Mm. So you are more than just a hairdresser. Yeah. You are a chemist. You're a plumber. You're an electrician. But first and foremost, you're a friend to these people. Is that why you love it? Yeah. Is it more than the hair? Is it, is it more the sort of... Um, yes robot? and no. I have the most incredible clients, which I'm hoping all of them will actually listen to this. But I have some that call themselves my friends and I would call them a friend as well. And there were people that they go out their way to make sure that I'm okay. They will message me out mm-hmm. the blue and just check in on me. And yeah. they would always see how I'm doing. And they mm. all say, I'm in awe of you and everything else. The support network that I have is incredible. Yeah. Again, I don't think I would have had as good as one in the UK as I do here. I think community's right. smaller here, so mm-hmm. but bigger. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, it also speaks to uh, just how tough you are. It's like you're an immigrant and you don't obviously don't have native language. Mm-hmm. None of us do, right? Nope. As, as immigrants, to this, immigrants to this country. And yet you've managed to carve out... My part in the world. Community. Yeah, yeah exactly. That, that, again, like you're grounded at the, at the foundation of these families, of the stories of all these families. I remember That's, a lot as well. Yeah, no. I remember like I a hell of a lot. I, I don't write anything down. I always pride myself of being able to be a good listener mm-hmm. and really taking... Yeah. Because you want to be able to say, oh, hey, Cindy, how how was... Uh, you went to Scotland this time. How was it? How was your daughter in Scotland? Right. You know, you remember right. things on the people you really connect with. And right. I, I, I have to say, I pretty much connect with every single one of my clients. Wow. <laughs> I, I have probably 5%, I'd say, are just the people that come in once or twice a year. But even on the once or twice a year people, I'm still talking to them. Yeah. Like, I had clients message me who I haven't seen in about a year after I announced the birth of my niece and my nephew, just checking I'm okay. <laughs> wow. They're not Especially. worried. They, they wish me muzzle off and stuff, but they're just saying to me, just checking you're all right. Right. And that, yeah, means more to me than anything. Well, it's 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 what you're doing, but but uh, the, the reversal, but exactly. Yeah, it's like you're paying attention. It's like, hey, you exist, and I see you. And by the yeah. way, I'm I'm letting you know that I see you. And they're like, not a number. And they're, you know, I I can't stand the fact that in this country the hairdressers are mainly male, mm. and it comes across as a very chauvinistic job here. That it really is. It's not. It's not unheard of that a male hairdresser in this country thinks themselves as God. They really do. <laughs> well, explain, They've got the biggest that. head on their shoulders. Why? Because they think they know better. It's it's a very common no thing better here. Than who? No better. Like okay, I was sitting down. If I was to go into a salon, the quite well known salon, let's say in the Tel Aviv, and it mm-hmm. was literally predominantly owned by a man. Okay. I'd had the man do my hair because I want the the top stylist doing my hair. Okay. He has gone and done exactly what he wants. Uh, not listen to anything I say. Okay. That story is ever so familiar on a daily basis in mm. this country. I tend to take the people in that have had that experience and they uh-huh. come to me to fix it. Okay. <laughs> That's what tends to happen with me. But yes, so that that's what I meant by chauvinistic and okay. egotistical. That's the word. Okay. So they think they've given this woman this amazing haircut and colour and everything else. They look incredible. Mm-hmm. But when she goes home and washes her hair and she's looking like a mushroom, <laughs> doesn't know what to do with it, then mm-hmm. what? Mm-hmm. So Is that, now this is com- a completely ignorant question, but is that always the fault of the hairdresser or... Is it just really bad communication on the woman's part or they saw something in a magazine that's just terrible like on them or what? I think it's to do with the hairdresser. Yeah. I think to be a good hairdresser, you have to know your client. Okay. Know what they really want. Look at their face. Look at their eyes. Look at how their symmetry is. Mm. And know that if someone's coming up to you and saying to you, okay, I want to go platinum blonde, uh, which is like a silvery gray blonde. Yeah. I want to go platinum blonde, but I am black haired, been using a box colour for 15 years and now I've done, I want it done professionally. 
I did have this conversation with somebody about two years ago and I wouldn't do it. Wow. And what I did instead was got them on a different path, which would keep their hair healthy. And now they've gone grey naturally, never have to have a colour done again. So I'm the person who would rather okay. be the the helper and not take someone's money than have you seen my chair and do what I want. And that's and that's the therapy session. It's like pretty I'm, much. I'm getting old. Help me through this. Yes. Right. 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 Same kind of thing. Wow. So yeah, and also that's... knowing like. If someone comes to me and, and she's got like my natural hair coloring, which is like really dark brown and she wants to have these blonde highlights and she's got really pale skin. Yeah. I'll say to her, it's not going to suit you. Happy for you to go to someone else if you want to get a second opinion. And then they go, they get their hair ruined and come back and fix me. <laughs> that's what usually happens. Wow. That's, that's, that's really cool. Yeah. To think about that. Um, okay. So a final thought about. Yeah. You know, you were talking about what people say to you and the, the kind of, they mess up the approach about, you know, it's it's difficult, right? On the other side of things to say, well, what do you say to a No person? one knows. Right? Because well. what can, I was thinking like, what can I possibly do to help you? And the answer is, is zero. Um, but I, I did actually have this other thought, which was sometimes I think about um, the power of the human voice. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, you know, it's obviously something that we take for granted, but, you know, I was, a couple of months ago, my uh, youngest, right, he was a baby, he was in the crib, he was crying, and I came up to him and I, um, I sang for him, right, and he listened and he fell back asleep, mm -hmm. right? and he doesn't know what I'm singing, he doesn't understand the words, it's just noises pitch. to him, right? High pitch of voice. Yeah, and, and I, I, at that moment, you know, not, and I had sung for my other sons before to just get them to sleep. And it just, it hit me. It's like, oh, like, it's just noise to him. Mm -hmm. But he's, you know, that, all those sounds that are, he's registering all that in his nervous system, mm -hmm. somewhere in his consciousness. And it's telling him, like, it's going to be okay. It's safe, yeah. And you can, you can go to sleep. Very much. No problem. Yep. And I was like, wow, that's, that's powerful, you know. Of course it is. But he knows nothing else. He only knows you to do that to him to make him feel safe. Sure, sure. But still, like the the mechanism by which that um, transfer of power, say, from me to him, mm. right, to calm him down, was my voice. Mm. And so I was like, wow, okay. So the human voice is actually capable of, of, of quite a lot. And, you know, I think about other things I've heard from people that have, uh, from other people you know, and it's, you know, th they also make noises and uh, they register on my uh, system and they change the way I think. And if they change the way they I think in a very profound way, then it changes the way I behave. Mm -hmm. And if it changes the way I behave, well, then it, it puts me on a different path in life. And if it puts me on a different path in life, then I'm going to be dealing with other people in other situations. Yep. And if I'm dealing with other people in other situations, then I'm, I'm changing their lives as well, right? And if I'm changing their lives in well, as well and they're changing mine, then, I mean, you just keep going on and on and on. You, you, you change the world. Rip right? effect. That's the power of the human voice. Yeah. And so I think the only thing that I could possibly help you with really is to amplify your voice um, and hope that women of all ages right in their 30s and their 20s or mm -hmm. your little girls for mm -hmm. that for that matter yeah listen to someone like you and say it can you know, be done it can be done well and not only can it be done but it's like plan your life in a way that's smart yeah right i mean nobody nobody has their shit together no matter what they say not one person in this world has got their shit together everyone's got their problems but it may look like from the outside they do yeah the reason why I started vlogging and the reason why my voice is being, well, I hope it's being heard, you know, like the Road versus Wade thing that got turned over mm -hmm. and then a week later when it was put into effect or however long later it was, there was a woman who was 25 weeks pregnant after IVF who got told that genetically her baby had a, a default mm -hmm. and that the baby wouldn't survive past his first birthday. Wow. So I put myself in her shoes. This was IVF as well. So I thought, 
okay, I've been trying for a baby all my pretty much all my life. I want a baby. And then I finally get pregnant. And then you're halfway through the pregnancy to be told your baby won't survive the first year. And then to be told you can't abort it because you're in a state of America that doesn't allow abortions. Mm -hmm. I was just, I went crazy. I lost my shit because I thought to myself, that is your basic human right. And it's something you've always wanted your entire life. I, I just thought to myself, that poor woman would have to give birth to potentially a baby that could, it, it, it wouldn't possibly make it to the pregnant end of the pregnancy as well. And that's when I started vlogging and I started voicing my, because fertility and IVF and IUI, all of it is a very taboo subject. You think so? Oh yeah. We speak to women and, and around. When I started vlogging, I was getting messages from people I went to school with, like three or four messages at a time from people that I have known for years, I had no idea they had struggles. Right. Because they've just had a baby. Mm -hmm. Who's going to know? Mm -hmm. One minute you're pregnant, the next minute you've had a baby. Yeah. No one talks about it. No one talks. It's just as bad as the whole thing. I think it's got better now. But the whole thing about men not being able to voice how they feel. It's a very, very similar thing because society tells you certain things you could keep to yourself and certain things you can talk about. I don't understand why more women aren't talking about their struggle so that maybe future generations of women can have a look at themselves and get themselves checked out more frequently okay. so that my sisters, I didn't have to tell them that, you know, make sure you get really deeply looked at because, you know, you could end up with the same thing as me. Yeah. If I have helped one woman or one young girl to go and get a pap smear to get herself checked, to get herself looked at so that she, her endometriosis or PCOS is under control, that means she can get pregnant when she's ready to do so. My job's done. You've become a mother of someone else. Exactly. I would rather no one else went through the heartache and the whole devastation that I feel every single time I have a cycle. And yeah. I don't if my mum's going to listen to this, she probably doesn't realise just how I actually feel. Every time... I get told it doesn't work. I take it on the chin. I move on. But inside, I feel like someone's punching me 10 times in one go. But all the time. It must feel like death, no? I do feel like hiding myself away. I really do. I honestly feel that... I don't see what my purpose in life should be if I'm not here to be a parent. Um, I'm not here to be someone's hairdresser, that's for sure. I'm here, I'm put on this earth to be a mother. And if I've come to terms with the fact that it's not going to happen for me and everything else, if I can help someone else realise that, oh shit, maybe I haven't had myself checked for a while, let me go and get my blood checked, let me go and get myself scanned and stuff yeah. and make sure that yeah. everything is still working right. Yeah. Well, that's the power that you have in your voice. And that's why I'm doing it. That's all it takes. It's just one person to fully understand what you're going through. And if there's women out there who are really struggling to get pregnant, especially the ones in the UK, all I can say is if you're struggling for more than a year or more than two years and your doctor's turning around to you and saying, no, you're young, you're fine, get on with it, fuck off that doctor and go and get someone else. Mm -hmm. Seriously. Get second opinions, get third opinions, get fourth opinions. You are the boss of your life. And I wish I had the guts to have done that years ago because I've now realised that these doctors are working for me, not the other way around. Yeah. And if there's something I want, my doctor will do it. And he has done. And the last cycle I did, I got grade one and grade two eggs. I haven't had grades one and two since four years ago when we first started because I told him I wanted to fertilise my embryos for three days instead of two. And he took it. I know my body. Don't ever, ever second guess yourself into that. You're a gangster. Hell yeah. <laughs> Probably not NWA kind of style. But listen, if I if I if I don't if I let as I said, I allow myself to grieve. I gave myself the day when I t get told I'm not pregnant. I tell everyone, I make it known, I have my cry. It may last a couple of days. But I allow myself the time and I think you have to to be to be kind to yourself mm -hmm. and then I go and smoke a big fat joint have a nice glass of wine and then I move on 
go and see my doctor, find out what's the next step, what we're doing next, yalla, 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 done. Did, and the, did the weed help you? Um... Well, when I don't smoke it, obviously when I'm trying to get pregnant, right, it's right, just right, like right, right. I, I, with my anxiety is worse as well during those times because I can't smoke it. But yeah. it helps me after being told that I'm not pregnant. Of course I'm going to run and get a joint. I'm not pregnant. And then I usually yeah. have to start my period straight after that as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm in a lot of pain. Mm -hmm. So it's a comfort for me because it 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 relaxes me and gives me a whole nother outlook where I can think a bit differently and think a little bit positively, actually. Also, you're coming at this with a clean conscience, right? Like, who's going to tell you that you haven't done everything you fucking could yep. until now? Exactly. Right. I've quit. I quit smoking. I quit smoking uh, weed because I'm able to do that. I can just give it up and not have to go back to it. Yeah. But the minute I'm on told no, then I'll go back to it. You know, I've nothing. <laughs> Don't have to cleanse your body just yet. <laughs> it's usually actually I usually when I usually um, give up everything to sort of when I go to the doctor for the first time, mm -hmm. when to start the new cycle, when I start injecting. That's usually when I stop. Whew. Man, roller coaster, right? No, I'm just I'm I'm in awe. I'm really when I, when I say you're a gangster, that's that's you're a tough motherfucker. So. I have to be. If I'm not, yeah. then What's going to happen? What, what will be of me if I'm not a positive? If yeah. I'm not positive, yeah. then my husband's not positive. If right. my husband's not positive, I'm not positive. So you have to look at what our... You have to outweigh the positive. The positive needs to outweigh the negative. And if it doesn't, then you really have to reassess that part of your life and yeah. say, well, what am I going to do now? Also, all the, other, all the other alternatives are terrible. Exactly. You only really have one choice. I don't want to spend all day in bed. Yeah, get you up want and, to do that. and keep keep moving forward. Precisely. Exactly what I want to do. Sarah, um, this was amazing. I um, I've got to send you the link to the um article that was written about. Yeah, as well. yeah, so, yeah, please yeah, do. do um, and everyone should check out your vlogs. Yes, they're on, they're only on my Facebook page. I mean, they are public. So anyone that wants to type in my name or anything can actually have a look at my videos. Yeah. I've made them public. Yeah. Um. I have had people message me asking me if I'm going to vlog again in the next cycle. I don't know. It was a very good way of being like a whole dear diary kind of thing. And I wasn't doing it for attention. I wasn't doing it. As I said, I was doing it if I could help one person going through this, knowing that first of all, they're not on their own. And secondly, that, oh shit, maybe I should get myself, you know, checked out and looked after. Yeah. Then I've won. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I, I say keep doing it. If, yeah, if I you think can. so. I think if I it, might. I think I might. I might not do it Maybe it also much. helps you put you in the right mental framework, right? Well, yeah. You might be right there. I think it can really have a good positive outlook on your mental attitude. Yeah. I think everyone should have a podcast. <laughs> yeah, I really do, actually. This, is, this has been great therapy for me today, actually. Really? really good. No, seriously. It's been... Good to talk to non-doctory kind of person <laughs> about what's going on. So, yeah, yeah. And it's nice. It's been good. good for me as well, so thank good. you for having me. Good. Sarah, I wish you the best of luck. Thank you. Thank you so much. Big kiss. Thank you very much.